Good afternoon. Thank you for attending this online webinar hosted by Seacrest Wardle. Today's topic is premises liability, ordinary negligence, and no fault. My name is Paul Shkreli. This presentation, in conjunction with materials from the Seacrest Wardle Premises Liability Practice Group Handbook, serve as an excellent guide in navigating these types of claims. During this webinar, there will be some instances wherein we discuss particular cases and whether or not these would fall under a premises liability, ordinary negligence claim, or both. During this time, there will be a brief few second pause wherein you'll be asked to decide which of these cases this would fall under. Afterwards, we will provide you with the ruling from the court. As always, should you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to myself or Mr. Mark Van Nest at your earliest convenience and we will be more than happy to provide some insight into your question. First, let's discuss the difference between a premises liability claim and one based in ordinary negligence. The primary difference between these two causes of action comes down to whether a defendant's potential liability arises from the defendant's conduct or a condition on the land controlled by the defendant. For example, let's consider a retail store employee who's been assigned to mop a floor. When preparing the mop bucket, they add too much cleaning agent to the bucket, and after they're done mopping, they leave a slippery, soapy residue on the tile floor after it's dried. Shortly thereafter, a customer then slips on the floor, sustains an injury, and eventually brings suit against the store. Was the cause of the plaintiff's fall the fact that the defendant put too much soap in the water? Or in other words, was the cause of the plaintiff's fall due to the defendant's negligence? Or was the cause of the fall a condition of the premises? That is to say, was the cause of the plaintiff's fall the slippery floor, regardless of how it came to be? In this case, if the plaintiff wished to avoid summary disposition based on the open and obvious doctrine, she may wish to plead general negligence as opposed to premises liability only. Again, in considering the difference between the two, in this world of premises liability, the plaintiff will sometimes seek to plead his or her claim as one of general negligence instead of strictly premises liability. Typically, the primary motivation for this is to avoid the open and obvious doctrine. This is a defense that has been the subject of many court opinions resulting in the dismissal of premises cases. A seminal case in this area is Layer v. Kitchen, a 2005 case. In this case, the defendant borrowed the plaintiff's tractor, equipped it with a front-end loader, and broke a hydraulic hose while using the front-end loader on, the, on his farm. The following day, both the plaintiff and the defendant went to the farm to fix the front-end loader. While they were working on the tractor, the, the bucket pinned the plaintiff's decedent between the bucket and the tractor, causing his death. The plaintiff's decedent sued the defendant, alleging a single count of general negligence. The trial court determined that the claim was sounded in premises liability and granted summary disposition based on the open and obvious doctrine. On appeal, the layer court ruled that plaintiff had claims surrounding in both ordinary negligence and premises liability, and that the open and obvious doctrine did not apply to the ordinary negligence claim. Essentially, the appellate court ruled that plaintiff had claims against both the defendant for his conduct while working on the tractor, as well as premises liability, inasmuch as the defendant had a duty to protect the plaintiff from unreasonable risks on the land and to warn of those risks as well. The court similarly held that just because a plaintiff brings a premises liability action, that same plaintiff is not precluded from making a separate claim grounded on an independent theory of liability based on the defendant's conduct. Let's compare this with the Buhalis v. Trinity Consulting case. This case is from 2012. On appeal, the Court of Appeals dealt with the facts of this case, wherein plaintiff slipped and fell on ice outside of the defendant's building. The plaintiff pled both a premises liability cause of action as well as an ordinary negligence cause of action. At the trial court level, the premises liability claim was dismissed based on the open and obvious doctrine, but the separate ordinary negligence claim survived. However, on appeal, the Buhalis Court ruled that if the plaintiff's injury arose from an allegedly dangerous condition on the land, the action sounds in premises liability rather than ordinary negligence, and that this is even true when the plaintiff alleges that the premises possessor created the condition giving rise to the plaintiff's injury. 
Essentially, the court established the rule that even when a plaintiff asserts that the defendant caused the dangerous condition by some negligent act or omission, the cause of action is not transformed from one of premises liability into one for ordinary negligence. The Buhalis court ultimately ruled that the entire case should have been dismissed because it was founded in premises liability and therefore did not su survive the open and obvious doctrine. We must also consider two separate opinions from the Michigan Supreme Court which have offered some guidance on this issue. The first is Kwiatkowski v. Coachlight Estates, a 2008 case. This single sentence decision from the Michigan Supreme Court adopted the dissenting opinion from the Court of Appeals. In Kwiatkowski, the plaintiff lived in a mobile home located in a park controlled by the defendant. The plaintiff was injured as defendant's agent opened a door striking the plaintiff, calling, causing him to fall and injure himself. Plaintiff sued defendant alleging a theory of premises liability, and the defendant moved for summary disposition based on the open and obvious defense. The trial court granted defendant's motion but gave plaintiff an opportunity to file an amended complaint making an ordinary negligence claim against the defendant as well. When the defendant sought summary disposition, this time on the ordinary negligence claim, the trial court denied this motion. The Court of Appeals would later reverse the trial court, finding the plaintiff's alleged injury was caused by a condition of the land and not defendant's conduct, and therefore sounded in premises liability. However, the dissent found that plaintiff's claim was based on defendant's negligence in opening the door as opposed to defendant's failure to protect the plaintiff from a dangerous condition on the land. The Supreme Court reversed the Court of Appeals, adopting this dissenting opinion. In other case, Campau v. Pioneer from 2015 involved a plaintiff who was watching lawnmower races when one of the lawnmowers lost control and came through the fence near where the plaintiff was watching. As she backed up to make sure she avoided the mower, she tripped over a railroad tie and broke her wrist. She brought counts for premises liability and for ordinary negligence against the defendant. The trial court determined that the plaintiff's claims were sounded in premises liability only and dismissed the complaint based on the open and obvious doctrine. The Court of Appeals reversed the trial court in a two-to-one decision, holding that the open and obvious doctrine may apply to the plaintiff's premises liability claim. However, the plaintiff also had a valid ordinary negligence claim to which the open and obvious defense did not apply, inasmuch as the defendant breached its duty to safely design the track and operate the races. In another one-paragraph opinion, the Supreme Court overruled the Court of Appeals and reinstated the trial court in holding that the railroad tie was a condition of the land and was open and obvious. Similarly, on October 14, 2015, the Supreme Court heard oral arguments in Black v. Schaefer, and its opinion has not been released as of this writing. This case involves a plaintiff who was shot on the defendant's property by a gun owned by the defendant. The Court of Appeals found that the case was one sounding in ordinary negligence and not premises liability. However, in granting leave to appeal, the Supreme Court instructed the parties to address whether the claim was founded in ordinary negligence or premises liability. The opinions from Lair and Kwiatkowski show us that, contingent upon the facts, it is not always clear whether a cause of action arises from a condition of the land or from a defendant's conduct. A plaintiff is likely to see a claim for general liability survive summary disposition when the defendant's actions are unrelated to the defendant's status as a controller of the premises or when the defendant's physical act directly caused the plaintiff's injury. Now, let's run through some examples where I'll provide a fact scenario and give you a few seconds to assess whether this would be found in premises liability, ordinary negligence, or both. There is an extensive list in the PLPG guidebook for your future reference, but in the meantime, let's see if you can guess the correct answer. Example 1. Where a plaintiff was injured when the defendant's portable hot oil fryer tipped over when wind blew in the walls of the tent that the fryer was under, spilling oil. If you guessed this would be a case found in premises liability and not ordinary negligence, you are correct. The next example, where a minor plaintiff drowned after the defendant allegedly allowed its swimming pool to become cloudy and allowed an emergency door to remain propped open, allowing the minor plaintiff access to the pool area. 
the correct response would be ordinary negligence. The next example, where a plaintiff alleged the defendant was negligent in inviting festival attendees onto defective and dangerous land where they encountered an uneven sidewalk. In this case, the Court of Appeals determined that the plaintiff's cause of action was found in premises liability and not ordinary negligence. The next example, where a third party was cutting down a tree with a chainsaw as the plaintiff and the defendant held ropes to pull it down and the defendant ran away, causing the tree to fall on the plaintiff. In this case, the Court of Appeals determined that the plaintiff's claim sounded in both premises liability and ordinary negligence. The next example, where a plaintiff fell and broke a bone while walking across a parking lot with uneven pavement grades. In this case, the Court of Appeals found that the plaintiff's cause of action was found in ordinary negligence and not premises liability. And our last example, where a plaintiff slipped on water in a service bay and fell while being escorted by an employee at an auto dealership. In this case, the Court of Appeals determined that plaintiff's claim was found in both premises liability and ordinary negligence. When you refer to the written materials in the premises liability practice group guidebook, you will see almost 30 examples of unpublished opinions. While these cases are not binding upon the court, it is clear there are some cases when a claim's basis in either premises liability, ordinary negligence, or both is easily ascertainable. Now we will talk about the interplay between no fault and premises liability. The first case we will discuss is Kemp v. Farm Bureau, a 2015 case wherein plaintiff sought no-fault benefits after injuring himself while falling in his driveway. When plaintiff fell, he was unloading personal items from the backseat of his pickup truck. In a two-to-one decision, the Court of Appeals ruled that plaintiff's injury had nothing to do with the transportational function of the vehicle, and therefore, the injury did not arise out of the use of a motor vehicle as a motor vehicle. As such, the plaintiff in this case was not entitled to no-fault benefits. This case provides some guidance on the interplay between premises liability and a separate cause of action brought pursuant to the Michigan No-Fault Act. If the plaintiff in Kemp had injured himself in some other manner while attempting to retrieve a personal item from the back of his truck, for example, if he fell on uneven concrete while retrieving the item, according to this unpublished opinion, he would be precluded from no-fault benefits. However, under those circumstances, he may have a claim in premises liability instead. The next case we will discuss is Grantham v. Jiffy Lube in Allstate. In this 2011 case, the plaintiff took his vehicle to a Jiffy Lube for an oil change. After driving his vehicle into the service garage, the plaintiff exited his vehicle and began walking to the office area to pay. At that moment, he slipped in the snow-covered parking lot. While on the ground, the plaintiff saw there was oil underneath the snow. Plaintiff sued both Jiffy Lube and Allstate, his no-fault carrier. The trial court dismissed the claims against both defendants. With respect to the no-fault claim against Allstate, the trial court determined there was no genuine issue of material fact regarding whether the plaintiff's injury arose out of the use or maintenance of his motor vehicle as a motor vehicle. The injury was not directly related to the motor vehicle's character as a motor vehicle and there was no causal connection between the vehicle and the plaintiff's injury because the injury was incidental to the oil change. With respect to the claim against Jiffy Lube, the Court of Appeals found that the snow presented an open obvious danger even though there may have been oil underneath the snow. Case law establishes that an individual is expected to exercise caution when approaching snow because of the inherent likelihood that the person could slip. In another case, Jackson Ruffin v. Metro Cars from 2008, the plaintiff was injured when she attempted to exit a shuttle owned and operated by defendant and slipped on the shuttle's snow-covered steps, sustaining serious injury. Plaintiff filed an ordinary negligence claim against defendant and, on appeal, the defendant argued that the trial court erred by not instructing the jury on the open and obvious doctrine. The Court of Appeals held the open and obvious doctrine applies only to premises liability actions and that the case was not one found in premises liability. 
Rather, the case was a third party ordinary negligence claim and therefore the open and obvious doctrine did not apply. On appeal, the defendant cited an 1887 opinion from Caniff v. The Blanchard Navigation Company for the proposition that open and obvious doctrine would apply to dangerous conditions that exist on passenger vehicles. In Caniff, the plaintiff was an experienced sailor and was injured when he fell through an open hatchway on the deck of the defendant's ship, which was stowed away for off-season. The Michigan Supreme Court held that plaintiff had enough experience to realize the danger of his conduct and was precluded from recovery because of his own negligence. While the Supreme Court did not specifically use the term open and obvious, it referred to the case in a 1992 opinion as being an important case in the development of the open and obvious danger doctrine. This 1992 case is Riddle v. McClouth Steel Products Corporation, and that citation can be found in the written materials. Essentially, the Jackson Ruffin Court determined that just because the Caniff opinion may have been part of the theoretical basis for what would eventually become the open and obvious doctrine, the Court of Appeals had explicitly stated the open and obvious doctrine applies in premises liability cases which arise out of the injuries occurring on land. In this case, the injury was caused by the maintenance, or more accurately, the lack thereof, of the steps on a passenger vehicle. The court also added, even if the open and obvious doctrine had applied in this case, the dangerous condition was effectively unavoidable and would therefore form a basis for liability despite its open and obvious nature. In another case, Perez v. STC and State Farm from 2005, the plaintiff and her grandson went to McDonald's and parked in a handicapped parking spot near the entrance. The plaintiff testified she did not notice any debris when she pulled into the parking spot. As she was clo closing the door to her vehicle after exiting, her right foot slipped on something and she fell, injuring herself. After going into the store to make an incident report, she returned to the place of the fall and saw ketchup-covered french fries on the ground near the driver's door, which looked like they had been driven or walked over. She similarly noticed food on her shoe. Plaintiff alleged premises liability against McDonald's for failing to maintain the parking lot in a safe condition and similarly brought a claim for no-fault benefits pursuant to the Michigan No-Fault Act against State Farm, alleging her injuries arose out of the ownership, operation, maintenance, or use of her vehicle. Both State Farm and McDonald's were granted summary disposition by the trial court, which indicated plaintiff could not prove notice of the smashed food, which was fatal to her premises liability claim, and that, since the use of the car was unrelated to the injury, the No Fault Act was not triggered. The Court of Appeals found plaintiff's injury did not satisfy the first step of the No Fault Coverage Analysis because her injury was not related to the transportational function of the vehicle. Plaintiff testified the closing of her door had nothing to do with her fall. The Court of Appeals also found plaintiff was not alighting from her vehicle when she fell because she had finished removing herself from the confines of her vehicle and had planted both feet on the ground, according to her own testimony. Therefore, as she was not entering or exiting the vehicle when the injury occurred, she was not eligible for no-fault benefits. With respect to the premises liability claim, the Court of Appeals agreed with the trial court in that there was no evidence McDonald's or its employees caused the hazard or had actual knowledge of it. While notice may be inferred from evidence that the hazard existed long enough that a prudent person would have discovered it, there was no evidence regarding the length of time that the food was in the parking lot. The Court of Appeals upheld the trial court's dismissal of the premises liability claim as well. Thank you for attending this webinar entitled Premises Liability, Ordinary Negligence, and No Fault, Oh My! Please contact us with any questions or comments you may have.